rolling today's meeting at Dennett Road Educational Complex. Uh, we will be coming back from a uh, hour and a half executive session at approximately 4 p.m. for an, a public session, which will be followed briefly again by another uh, a part of the executive session. So we'll be recessing at approximately 4 o'clock for that. Under Section 3-305B of General Provisions Article of the Maryland Anti-Data Code, there's one reason before we go into closed session and part of for this part of the meeting to discuss the appointment, employment, assignment, promotion, discipline, demotion, compensation, removal, resignation, and performance evaluation of appointees, employees, or officials over whom this public body has jurisdiction. Any other personnel matter that affects one or more specific individuals. Specifically, the topic for this part of the meeting will be 3-305B1. Topic includes superintendent evaluation. The reason this topic will be discussed in closed session instead of open session is as follows. Personnel topic pursuant to 3-305B1 disposed above will be considered in closed session rather than open session because they include a discussion of specific employees, which is a confidential employment matter. Hearing all of that, is there an objection by any board member going into executive session? Hearing none, there's a motion to do so. So moved. So moved by Jason. Second. Second by Rodney. All those in favor of going into executive session, say Bob saying aye. Aye. Those opposed, nay. And we are in executive session. Good afternoon. Uh, we have uh, come back from an uh, hour and a half uh, executive session uh, that was geared as a personnel topic. The first thing that we're going to do in public session is we do have a swearing in today. Uh, we have uh, Sheila Keating from the uh, circuit court, the clerk of the court, who will be swearing in our new board member, Mr. Don Morin. Uh, congratulations to you, Don, on being a part of uh, the Gary County Board of Education. I think you, I know you've been with the college for many years. I think you will probably find us uh, different than the college <laughs> in many ways, hopefully good ways. But uh, once again, congratulations. We're glad to have you as a part of our, as a part of our, our group. So with that, uh, without any uh, further uh, ado, uh, Sheila, if you will do the swearing in, Don, if you would come up there, we'll use that microphone and we'll use uh, the uh, camera behind me to record uh, the swearing in. Okay, great. I need you to raise your right hand for me. You do swear that you will support the Constitution of the United States and that you will be faithful and bear true allegiance to the state of Maryland and support the Constitution and laws thereof, and that you will, to the best of your skill and judgment, diligently and faithfully, without partiality or prejudice, execute the office of member of the Board of Education of Garrett County according to the Constitution and laws of this state. I do. Thank you. Don, I will say that's the last time people are going to clap for you. Yeah. <laughs> so take that in and be good with it. <laughs> okay, yeah, good. Okay, we'll go ahead and uh, go uh, through with our um, um, public session for just a moment. The, we will be going into executive session immediately. Again, this is a certainly a different group, so we'll have to take a vote again. Under Section 3-305B of the General Provisions Article of the Maryland Data Code, there are three reasons the board will go into closed session this evening. To discuss the appointment, employment, assignment, promotion, discipline, devotion, compensation, removal, resignation, or performance evaluation of employee appointees, employees, or officials over whom this public body has jurisdiction, any other personnel matter that affects one or more specific individuals, to consult with counsel to obtain legal advice on legal matters, to conduct collective bargaining negotiations, or consider matters that relate to negotiations. Specifically, the topics for tonight will be 3-305B1, topics including certificated staffing recommendations, tenure staffing recommendations, workman's compensation appeal update. 3-305B7, Topic includes insolent litigation. 305B9, topic includes CBiz healthcare audit. The reason these topics will be discussed in closed session instead of open session is as follows. 
The personnel topics pursuant to 3-305B1 disclosed above will be considered in closed session rather than open session because they include a discussion of specific employees which is a confidential employment matter. The legal topic pursuant to 3-305B7 disclosed above will be considered in closed session rather than open session because the board will be receiving specific legal advice from counsel which is protected by attorney-client privilege. The negotiations topic pursuant to 3-305B9 disclosed above will be considered in closed session rather than open session because of the confidential nature of the collective bargaining process. With all that said, are there any objections to the board going into executive session? Hearing none, is there a motion to do so? So moved. So moved by Jason. Second. Second by Sadie. Discussion? All those in favor of going into executive session signify by saying aye. Aye. Those opposed nay, we are in executive session. I'd like to welcome everyone to the uh, regularly scheduled um, August 13th, 2024 Board of Education meeting. And before we get started, I'd certainly like to introduce our newest board member, Mr. Don Morin, will be joining us. Uh, he takes uh, Mr. Josh Heinball's place and uh, congratulations, Mr. Morin, being appointed by the Commission to our board. We look forward to having you and I'm, I'm sure you're going to bring a, a wealth of advice to us. At least we're expecting you to bring a wealth of advice to us. So congratulations, welcome. Uh, we'll start uh, the uh, public session uh, asking you to stand for a moment of silence to be followed by the Pledge of Allegiance led by our board member. To the flag of the United States of America and to the Republic which stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Thank you, Cadence. Take a motion for the approval of the agenda. So moved. So moved by Jason. Second. Seconded by Sadie. Discussion? All those in favor of the public agenda as presented, signify by saying aye. Aye. Those opposed, nay. And the agenda is adopted. Take a motion for the approval of the consent agenda. So moved. So moved, so moved by Rodney, seconded by Jason. All those in favor of the approval of consent agenda, signify by saying aye. 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 Those opposed, nay. And the consent agenda is approved. To remind anyone and everyone that the closed session summaries and the announcements are on our web page, and certainly we encourage everyone to look at those uh, so that you can better keep up with what's uh, happening with uh, the Geary County's public school system. Uh, new business item is a limited notice to proceed uh, Southern and Northern Garrett High School partial roof replacements as an action item tonight to be presented by Mr. Wozlowski. Hey, good evening. I'm here uh, this evening for uh, for approval uh, to move forward with just a design phase uh, for the Northern High and Southern High partial roof replacements. Uh, this is a design build uh, concept that was approved through the IAC. So tonight we're asking for, and I believe um, item six will say it's 74,000 for Northern High, uh, A&E 91,000 for Southern High School. Item five gives you the total cost of the project uh, three million eight hundred for Northern High, four million six hundred for Southern High School. This was funded through the Maryland State uh, Healthy Schools Facility Fund uh, on our eighty nine eleven split. And a schedule in the back. I'll be back here in December to actually ask you for the contract award or approval. Uh, and construction will be next summer for those partial replace and for the. We're talking about the main part of the building is where these both replacements will be the larger. Mm -hmm not any of the additions. So this is gonna be a good portion of the yeah. main portion of the building that will do the roof replacement next summer. Okay. Superintendent McCartney, do you have a recommendation? Uh, the preliminary design services as, uh, as presented. Superintendent's recommending that we uh, proceed with the preliminary design uh, proposal. Is there a motion as such? So I move. make a motion to accept the superintendent's recommendation for the roof proposal uh, design phase for Northern and Southern High School. Motion by Mr. Van Sickle to approve, seconded by okay. Mr. Gloppelty. Discussion. Hearing no, no discussion. All those in favor of the uh, action item uh, to proceed with the preliminary uh, 
Design Services for Northern and Southern High School's roof replacements. Signify by saying aye. 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 Those opposed, nay. And we are a go. Thank you. Policies and procedures. IHBB gifted and talented in school-wide enrichment policy and procedure. This is a revision. And Ms. Smalls will make that presentation. Hello. This is our first read. The reason we are here to revise this policy and procedure is because we needed to be in compliance with Comar. So as you go through, you'll see in red that we have the legal aspect of it, then the purpose to align to the structure of what we do with our policies. The scope is really looking at our gifted and talented program. The policy statement, what we changed here was just the Gear County Public School System. And then some of this is directly from Comar just to align us, where it states GCPS will provide services beyond those provided by the regular school program for our gifted and talented students using appropriately differentiated evidence-based programs and services. Then we added some language to address the equity component in the red in the second paragraph on the back side or the second page and just looking at making sure that we're being equitable in who we are identifying. And going on to the next portion of C, looking at the Comar language, ensuring that we are offering professional development to our providers that are offering these services to our students as well as our administrators and any other personnel that would need it. And then responsibilities for implementation with Dr. McCartney, of course, overseeing the development of the guidelines and the components to be used. Are you the gifted and talented administrator? I am the supervisor, yes. I'm, I'm, I'm in the procedures, it talks about a gifted and talented administrator. Yes, are so technically that, that would that be person? me, yes, okay. yes. Yeah, okay, okay, yeah. And then just in procedures for information purposes, we really did look at the background stating that the law was the reason we're doing this and updating to make sure that we're in compliance and meeting the needs of our students. We didn't change the aptitudes that we use to really identify them. The administrative procedures looks at a summary of that process and then we are removing the timeline mostly because that can change at any given time and we want to make sure that it stays current and that these forms are up to date as well. For instance, in the identification process, it used to it currently states on the board's website that we need to get updated an old test that we used. We're now using iReady. So with curricular changes, that can change some of the benchmarks and things that we need to address. And then it goes through that identification procedure and services that there's a GT committee that is meeting at the schools, they're school-based. The process that they use for a needs assessment, the designated school personnel sending an eligibility letter home to the parents, written appeals that can happen if they are denied or accepted or however the parent chooses to appeal the process, and then the appropriate services that need to be offered as well as a statement on equity in identification. And then the forms associated with the referral identification and notification will be placed at the schools. We're also in the process of working through a draft that will be placed on the board's website for the guidance for GT programs. That's not listed here, that's just for your information. And then just adding a few components to what we have in our high school programs with the Bobcat Academy at Frostburg State University and apprenticeships and then power school is where we'll be placing some of those permanent pieces in their record. Questions? Uh, I, I, I have a scenario. Uh, Johnny's in the fifth grade, and uh, he was recommended, nominated, found to be in the gifted program. What happens? T tell me what happens. How, how does? How do we? How do we help Johnny in the gifted program? Well, first of all, we identified his aptitude. So Johnny would have taken a test in second grade called the COGAT. And so with that, we look at those very specific aptitudes that we have listed here within the procedure. Mm -hmm. We're looking at general intellect, which could be that math, reading, science, social studies. 
specific aptitude, and then we're looking at creative or productive thinking, leadership, and visual and performing arts. So generally, people will tend to think of gifted as being our academically accelerating students, but personally, my heart is after those students that are dual identified as well. So it could be that Johnny is a special ed student who is also receiving leadership training because that's who he is, or perhaps an engineer who's on his farm building mechanical pieces that will support. So we might put them on a program specific to engineering. So we start to assign mentors based upon the aptitude. And then we do lots of, there's always differentiation. So let's say Johnny is an academic student and he's in math. I'm not gonna give Johnny 26 problems of math that I already know he knows how to do. Part of the differentiation is compacting and also accelerating. So for the compacting, I might place Johnny in a more advanced setting with some of these skills. And we're doing some of that already with the algebra course that occurs in the middle school. That's compacting where we start to put in the seventh grade and eighth grade curriculum in a, in a tighter alignment because they can handle it. And then we start to accelerate them on the other end. With Johnny, he will also have pullout services with peers, meaning the gifted students, where they receive specific lessons that are designed to some of these aptitudes. And we start working with them on thinking about perceptual thinking and reasoning and things like that. So it's kind of twofold. In the general classroom, Johnny might get the three hardest problems in the math program. And then Johnny's going to be given some skills and some tasks that might be that he's working on his other gifted program, but he's also going to be thinking differently about the math and finding real life application or taking it to a project that he's already completing and trying to accelerate that process. How often does Johnny get pulled out? Johnny will get pulled out on a school based decision because staffing at each school, I can't tell you that Crellin's going to have the same opportunity for a pullout as what Northern Middle School would have. But Johnny will have opportunities within that school staff because we're going to a point of contact service. And so they will have clusters is what we call them and be working with those peers to work on projects. At some of our schools, it will be as much as daily, but I don't, I can't guarantee that for all schools. Yeah, I, I guess it's hard, <laughs> and uh, it's hard for me to wrap around how this is all working because, it, you know, you, we've been here for a while, and we used to have gifted and talented teachers that had gifted mm -hmm. and talented classrooms, and kids went into the gifted and talented classroom. And, and so the model we're using for this school year is the model that we've had for the majority of my career, and that's I'm older. Than been a minute. Um, I know, but <laughs> <It wasn't nice. laughs> no, I just mean, I know you have more experience yeah, in some I'll of these of realms, <laughs> but what we did the last two years previous to this was a COVID relief. As we were very focused on lifting the students who were struggling, we also identified a need to continue to accelerate those students. The brain is a muscle. We have to consistently exercise it no matter where it lands. You might be more fit than me, so you're going to do a different exercise than I am. Same thing with our brain. So we had to make sure that our students were getting the services that they need while everyone was in the recovery lift. Now that the COVID fund relief has ended, well, well, soon, we are returning to the model that we found to be very successful with points of contacts in the schools and the principals using their school-based personnel who know the children best mm -hmm. and working with them. Sure. Can, just a, another question or two. Um, approximately how many kids in Garrett County would be gifted and talented? Right now we're sitting at about 10%, but as we go through this next round, we already know I can think of one school where typically there might have been three or four students identified. We have 11 in that grade. So as the COGAT, the Cognitive Abilities Test, is administered, there are certain criteria within that that they register for the scores and they start looking at these aptitudes that are listed here and they start identifying those students and then they start working on those skills with them. Yeah. And the primary talent development 
that we haven't spoke about is what happens in kindergarten through second grade. So I do accredit a lot of what we've been doing to identify those talents and start to build them in our youngest children to why we're seeing an increase with the COGAT scores. Typically kids, what's the earliest that you're going to identify a gifted and talented student? We start in third grade using the COGAT at the end of second grade because it's just like a reading assessment. I wouldn't really want to formally assess a kindergartner until they've had enough time to develop the skills. Sure. Do you find that most kids that once they start in gifted and talented, they continue in it for until they get into the high school? Our policy is once gifted, always, always gifted. gifted. We need to identify and work with those students. We don't extract them. However, parents can choose to remove them from the program if that's their desire. And or a teacher could refuse to say, well, they're just not really. Um, no, there's a process and it's a team. It is not an individual decision. It is looking at the COGAT. It is looking at MCAP. It is looking at iReady. It is looking at if there's a parent referral, a student self-referral, or a teacher referral. All of these things are gathered together. It's a true analysis of the child and their abilities, not an individual opinion. Thank you. Excellent. I just, I just need to wrap my head around. I understand. Thank you. Other uh, questions? Oh, yes. I have a couple. Uh, so I noticed that in the procedure as I read through that, going back to your math example, right, and the teacher, hey, we're going to give Johnny the three harder problems because why are we giving him repetition that he already knows? There's nothing that holds the teacher accountable for actually following through with that procedure. So I'm a eighth grade math teacher and yes I'm supposed to do that for Johnny but guess what every day Johnny gets the same one through ten that the rest of the class does there's nothing that addresses that in the procedures there is but it's a different procedure it's called teacher evaluation and as we're educating our administrators and our teachers and we are rolling out a differentiation training as teachers return Mr. Hall is developing an asynchronous video that will be played to all staff pre-K through 12, and administrators. In addition to that, we have activities to try to support them in the initial lift of this, where for a half an hour after the half or the asynchronous piece, they will be working within their schools and their points of contacts to develop lessons to address that very issue. So I will take the blame for last year. I was learning the program. We didn't roll that out until March. And so now that we've been addressing it and principals are aware, they know it's an expectation and it is part of the law. So we're hired to follow that law. Therefore, the teacher evaluation system will address that. And then I have principals coming to me asking for support in this, and we are going to be delivering that. So, Superintendent, can we see where in the evaluation that will actually be covered in the teacher's evaluation? Yes. Thank you. I will send that to you. And um, since I have the mic, <laughs> I'm just going to keep talking sure. because um, I think through the presentation that you just heard, you understand why uh, Ms. Moss is our lead on this program and in, in the system. Some of the concerns that we've heard lately um, I think she's done an extraordinary job of meeting with individual parents and groups of parents trying to address those concerns. Um, and I would also say that some of those concerns are sort of ongoing concerns. Uh, we are, we strive for uh, perfect implementation. Uh, but when you said, I'll take the blame, um, I don't think anyone needs to take the blame for, for anything. Um, we have a very good plan. We have a very good program. And we need to continue to develop it and support our teachers and administrators in implementing the, um, the program as it's outlined. So thank you for that. No blame, please. <laughs> Sorry, I have more questions. Sure. Um, my next question, I guess, is, you know, we talked about the committee being a school-based committee, but as I look at some of the things that we're using to kind of propel the gifted and talented program, I heard the apprenticeship program. 
I heard Bobcat Academy, but there's no one external represented on that committee. So is there space to put someone either in the community that will be working with some of these resources on the committee? Because I will tell you, as someone that's familiar with the apprenticeship program, we've never been approached to say that it may be part of a GT program or Bobcat Academy is actually open to everyone, not just a GT student. So I can't see where that differentiates the GT student from the other students. So that portion is actually in the procedure. And when you go and look at the, the procedure, that addresses the enrichment. That's an enrichment, not necessarily just for the identified students. The committee I'm talking about would be the school-based committee that goes through and does the analysis of the child. Okay. And to be quite honest, um, I think that's probably appropriate. Sure. And they, you know, they could invite parent input, and they have that through that form that we have for parent referral. <laughs> and then I guess my next question is, is that I, I know that several parents have reached out to you this year, and you've done a great job answering their questions, that type of thing. But I will tell you, I don't know if they're getting, not necessarily from you, but communication of the projects that their students are actually participating in um, would be helpful. So if that communication and the parental involvement would be more regular, I think that would be helpful to them as well. So as I train the points of contact on Monday, part of that is this little document that I've shared with you in the past. Mm -hmm. It will be yeah. placed in the handbook that will be published to the board's website as soon as we go through this process. But if you look on that document once it's published, one of the pieces it talks about is coordinates a quarterly GT newsletter. The other thing that we have done is we have placed the report card for GT specifically into PowerSchool. So it will be sent right along with what happens with the regular report card. And within that, we are giving guidance on what the teachers need to identify. We are also within our training talking to those points of contact about doing the initial outreach, but then really encouraging the teachers to provide extra communication as well and asking for consideration of a GT component quarterly within the school newsletter. And then asking them to also send information to Mr. Green to be published on the website as events occur at the schools. And next question I guess would be for, for you, Superintendent. Do you feel as though, and, and you as well, feel free to answer. Don't wanna put you on the spot though. Um, do you feel as though we have the resources for the gifted and talented program with the lift that Comar is now requiring us, do you think we can do that and do that effectively? And do we have a plan in place for the next, so this is next year, do we have a plan in place for three to five years as Blueprint continues to ramp up the GT program? I would say in general terms, yes, we do. Um, I think we have a very rich system. I think the changes that some of our community maybe became used to with some of the COVID relief funds that we were using um, makes the transition back to a more typical program delivery a little bit more difficult for some members uh, of our public. But yes, I believe that we have the resources to do this. And I frankly believe that it will be a better program because a student is not gifted just when they're being pulled out by a teacher. They're gifted when they're sitting in that fourth grade seat for the rest of the day. So this program is sort of a hybrid of those two, where you have an opportunity to work with a specialist who's gonna move you along a little bit more. It's a very good use of our intervention teachers. We are thinking of intervention teachers, both in terms of being able to <clears throat> intervene for students who are having problems but also intervening for students who need to be accelerated. So, and, and with the training that Mrs. Most has 
alluded to and has shown me in more detail, yes, I believe that this system will continue to grow this program and serve our students well. And last question. Um, you brought up equity. Does Comar actually define the equity that we're looking at? Who is making the definition of what is equitable as we look at students for the GT program? And I say this knowing that higher education got burnt with this a few years ago as they looked at equity. So I want to see who's defining equity. Our equity and identification really addresses how we're identifying students and it's making sure that we're considering all students and all of these data points so that we are not using anything with bias to determine this. This is why it's not an individual teacher decision, but it's based upon the data, the COGAT, which is obviously a vetted program. Sure. And then MCAP, be what it may, it is what we are using and I ready. So this is So what about your fine art student? What about so what? your fine art student? Mm -hmm. You're fine. exactly right. Theater is a large part of it because there was a student I had. Painting is a I mean, there's lots of things. Yes. That's why I want to know right. what, well, who's deciding what's equitable and who's being considered. So within that, that's where the teacher referral would come in. So let's say they get to Northern Middle School and they've never been identified previously. And the art teacher there goes, look at this. Here's the referral form. They put it forth and then we identify. And the reason I said theater was because I had one at Route 40 who was strong in theater, mm -hmm. you know, and he was also a dual sure. identified. So that's why we have multiple pathways, multiple pieces. It's not one data point, but multiple ways to identify these students. And that's part of the awareness that we're sharing out as well with teachers, parents, and principals. I think about that one for a while, but this is first read. So I think I'll have more on that one when we come back. But I I'll figure you will. <laughs> <laughs> and and <clears throat> Go ahead. I can sort of see your wheels turning. Um, and I would be more than happy for Mrs. Moss to me to meet with you to, to talk that through if, if that is helpful. It is the, these kind of programs can be very complicated um, and I think we've shared we will sometimes have a student who is identified and people that don't know the student will scratch their head sometimes and say why is that student a part of this program but it is because there are different um, ways of being gifted so mm -hmm. thank you other questions? Okay. Thank you so much. Thank you very, very much. Great job. Blueprint strategic plan priorities on board feedback. Dr. Miller. Good evening. So um, about a month ago, I previewed to you that we would be coming tonight with um, a strategic plan update with the hopes of getting some board feedback on some of our priorities and strategies in relationship to the blueprint. And so that's the focus of tonight. And you'll notice on the first slide that it just clarifies some of the strategic plan terminology. This is something that we spent some time on with the executive blueprint committee as we were completing this work. Um, this work actually started back in, I would say last November, around last November. Um, and I'll just recall for the board that we were paired with Molly uh, DePasquale with uh, the AIB and a strategic facilitator. And she worked heavily with our Blueprint Executive Committee and myself to work through strategic planning around the blueprint. And as part of that, we, we, de we did need to clarify terminology, make sure that we were all talking the same language. Uh, and we did start with a needs assessment. And we called it a landscape analysis where we really looked at all facets of, of the system and where we were at and how we could really cross across pillars. Um, and to, to make our work more cohesive. 
You can see um, also on this lovely little map of running people um, that we had priorities that we work towards, goals, strategies, and then ultimately our vision and mission. And at the beginning of this process, we, we really spent time with the committee diving into doing some vision work of what our system could and should look like in 2032, 2033 after Blueprint is fully implemented. And we really started with the baseline of our system's vision, which is in policy um, that the board has spent time on developing and codified in our policy. Um, we learned that our vision that we currently have is pretty aligned to the blueprint and what the outcomes of the blueprint would expect for our system. Um, we have made some, I would call it minor revisions to be a little bit more in line with some of the newer term terminology, um, which will be coming to the policy committee on Thursday. Um, so you guys will be seeing that soon, but I bring that up because um, some of the priorities that you see today uh, are very much the priorities that are in the policy and procedure right now. Um, we found a lot of very good alignment, um, but there are, I, I do want to forecast while we're on this topic that you will be seeing a revised policy on that. Um, and in the coming month. So, um, but to go back to the terminology, uh, we looked at goals. The goals that we're looking at are really there to monitor, are we making the progress towards the outcomes that we're hoping to achieve? Are we on the right track? Our priorities that you're gonna be looking at tonight, uh, again, aligned to the vision that we already have, uh, are our big buckets of work. The things that we really wanna spend um, time with and that we believe that will help us reach the desired state of not just the vision for the school system but also the blueprint and then the strategies are more key investments of time and resources that will help us reach those goals and each strategy will have action steps to it so you're not going to see all of that tonight but we do want to go over some of the big buckets of work and and get board feedback on that so just to orient the board to some of the, the larger global blueprint outcomes that the state is looking at, you'll see on this slide um, many areas of student growth and achievement that will be monitored at the state level. Um, this is not considered an all-inclusive list. There are probably going to be others, but these are some that are common that we're seeing come up frequently and, and align with the priorities that the committee has um, proposed and also align with what the state's going to monitor. I'm sure there'll be other things that the AIB is monitoring, that the MSCE is monitoring. And then we also are going to be doing some internal monitoring of, of some of our um, implementation. Um, but you can see these are um, some of the big buckets uh, of goals that we're, we're hoping to monitor and, and achieve growth in. So I'll move to the priorities. And if you would go back to look at the policy on the vision of Garrett County Public Schools, you would see in that the priority of staffing, high quality instruction, and partnerships. Those are three themes that have existed in our, our policy and our board's vision for the school system for some time. When our committee looked at the vision and we looked at all of the pillars of the blueprint and how the pillars uh, connected and overlapped in a lot of ways, it made a lot of sense for us to lift up these priorities as we were able to find connections from all pillars of the blueprint in each one of these priorities. And I hope that you'll be able to see that in some of the strategies, but I'll go ahead and stop on this slide and you can see um, some some questions to just guide conversation that if the board has any thoughts on maintaining these priorities um, if there's strengths or pain points that exist or anything that you feel at this time is missing when you think about our blueprint implementation plan and the priorities set for the school system i'll just open the floor up for any feedback
-hmm. Well, I would say that uh, it's always our goal to ensure that every child gets high quality instruction. Um, and we have excellent teachers and leaders, both teacher leaders and administrators in buildings and central office to work collaboratively together to ensure that that's happening. So a continual cycle of improvement is what I would go to. Um, and we will, we, we have in the past and will continue to look at how are we going to improve instruction every day for each and every child. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so um, that's one measure that you can look at is, is quantitative data, whether it be iReady data or MCAP data or other um, standardized assessments. Uh, we also use evaluation data, observation data, walkthrough data. We've been training our teachers in, um, in uh, evidence-based practices. Um, one most noted in the most recent past is the science of reading. And so when we do walkthroughs, we'll be looking for um, practices that align with uh, evidence-based strategies, science of reading, and those when, when t students are um, instructed using those evidence-based practices and high quality instructional materials, we know they're getting access to high quality instruction. Mm -hmm. Devil's advocate. <laughs> yeah. It is. That's what we care the grade, the grade, everything really good. I do, and I, I do understand that a lot of the public, um, and, and we also look at the test scores as something that are very important. We want our students to achieve. Um, but I do go back to the fact, and I'll let Dr. McCartney jump in because I can see she's interested, um, that we are in the business of working with humans, uh, both human children and human adults, and learning. And learning is complex, and teaching is complex. Um, and so I still go back to it's a cycle of improvement that we're continually learning, continuing to do better. When we know be better, we do better. And unfortunately, and I know why, unfortunately, improvement will be the test scores in the, in the minds of virtually everyone, and that's improvement. And if we say, okay, we're going to improve the test scores by 2% next year, mm -hmm. and we don't improve by 2%, and it goes back to, did you ensure then that all students got a good and adequate education? Mm -hmm. And we know that. I mean, I'm a teacher, and you're, yeah. and we know that. I mean, I, I listen. Yeah. I know the answer. There's a lot question. of factors that go into a I test score. That. I know that. But, but the, <laughs> yeah, it's, it's the, I know. Ball, the ball score is the score. It is. And, it's, and unfortunately, we're all going to be held to that account. You know, I think it's one of the things that worries principals to death. Yes. Is mm -hmm. what's going to happen at the end of the year when you see the scores, you see the attendance rate. You see the dropout rate. You see all those things. You know, worried me to death, mm -hmm. or worried you to death. Uh, mm -hmm. What are, and that's what we gauge ourselves on. Unfortunately, as as a country, that's what we gauge ourselves on. And, yeah. Uh, so, but it's interesting discussion. Go ahead. No, it, I I will go ahead a little bit. Um, I I I have some concern with the word ensure too. Um. I, it's an expectation that I have as superintendent that we will have high quality instruction and that should lead us to better test results. But I think it's also important to recognize that our success isn't just a test result. Mm -hmm. Our success is also when we look at a 
the climate survey that the state uses. Our success can also be measured by the percentage of our students who go on to college. Our success can be measured by our increase in daily attendance. Our success can be measured by our public input that we consider as we're trying to develop programs. Um, our success is a certainly beyond the state testing program. Mm -hmm. We can look at the percentage of our students who take AP classes, which is climbing, which has an impact on your test results because you're widening your, widening your pool mm -hmm. of students who take AP classes. What we found is we enlarge the pool and more students are performing mm -hmm. well. That's a success. Mm -hmm. it, it's on us as a system, and Mr. Mm -hmm. Green, yeah, I'm looking at as my <laughs> public relations <laughs> specialist, to be sure that we tell the story of this system yeah. as a well-rounded system. Yeah. There are children in our system who struggle with testing. They are worthy of our attention. They are worthy of having their success noted by all of us. Mm -hmm. So I, I could go on and on, and I'll, I'll be quiet no, I think now, I think you said exactly the right thing. We need to enlarge mm -hmm. our picture mm -hmm. of success. We need to market the positives, and we do. Mark does a tremendous... Tremendous we're job working on that. We really do. We we talked we talked about that numerous times among ourselves, and 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 you're right that on that it, those are the successes that will far outweigh the test scores if we ensure that the public knows we've had all these successes. Yeah, we'd like test scores to be in the seventy percentile. So would anybody else in the state like that as well? But we're performing above the state average, mm -hmm. which is a good thing. Yes. Okay. But we've also done very well in these other areas, we have. much better than most counties. We have. So, yeah. you know, to me, the success of our system is the marketing that we do to show people what success we have. Yes, you're absolutely right. And I'll just say one more thing. Sorry. It's okay. <laughs> Go ahead. We will be more successful because we're not satisfied with where we are. Sure. Yeah. We are not satisfied. Right. That was my message today when we were meeting as the school improvement mm -hmm. team. We're at a good place in this county. I expect us to be much better. When we're undefeated, we'll be well. We'll be doing well. Yes, <laughs> that's right. So we'll, we'll keep at it. That I can promise you. Yeah. Uh, this instructional team and the support team in this county um, and our parents work very hard hard in many ways to support our students and we we need to celebrate jason yeah just just a few things with feedback and, and sorry dr miller i'm actually going to jump ahead a little bit on you as well because they're kind of all intertwined as i look at both slides both the priorities and the strategies mm -hmm. um one thing i think both are missing are accountability right so i think we need to whether as a system as a board whoever it may be but we need to name who's accountable for these superintendent all of us are going to do everything we can, but we need to name someone that's going to be accountable to carry these out. Second thing I notice is this is all great, but it's kind of like cream in the middle of my donut. I don't know what success looks like, if that makes sense. So improved scores is great, but improved scores by five points, 10 points, uh, yeah. 20 points. We need to build that out. That's, right. that's part of our next steps, um, and that'll be in our final... Like and draft. I'd like them to be a little mm -hmm. bit more direct, if that mm -hmm. makes sense. Mm -hmm. So the sentences are great, but I'm a big bullet point guy and like direct to the facts. So mm -hmm. as we move that through the next phase, if we can get more direct and succinct with those, those would be great. Measurable well, goals. Wrong. Yep. Yeah. Yeah. Quick question on uh, priority. No, Quick question about priority three. Uh, partnerships, what is a measure of success in, in evaluating that priority? Uh, what what do you measure? The number of meetings your staff uh, goes to with partners? Uh, how do you how do you evaluate if you're doing a better job uh, 
collaborating with with families. Uh, mm -hmm. It's just it's always a uh, is it a quantitative thing? The number of partnerships you've 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 done or it can be in or... some cases, um, like the one on um, on higher education partnerships. One of the things we're talking about is expanding our partnerships with higher education institutes for uh, hiring new teachers. And I believe the goal that we're discussing is um, adding five new partnerships over the course of time. So in some cases, it can be quantitative like that. Um, in other cases, I think it's more qualitative, like the partnerships that we have with um, our community action um, organizations or our uh, colleges. We get feedback and, and frequent feedback from those stakeholders um, on a regular basis. In fact, uh, the people that lead those organizations, a lot of them, not all of them, are on our executive blueprint committee. Um, so the president of uh, community action, uh, or is it president? It's the president of community action, right, Chris? Yeah. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. yeah. President of community action and um, president of the college. You know, th those are the types of people that are on some of our um, some of our committees. So also, we're doing focus groups um, with stakeholders. Um, we've been doing that for the last year. Um, so we started with uh, pre-K uh, and really looking at parents in our three-year-old classrooms and four-year-old classrooms. And so we worked with our partners in the Judy Center and targeted pre-K families to get specific feedback um, on our programming and how we could improve that programming to support greater numbers of students coming in. So it, a lot of different ways to do it. Um, it's not just probably going to be one way, but uh, to engage in that process. Yeah, it's, a, it's, it's sort of a difficult measure. I mean, you can you can have all kinds of partnerships, but how effective are the partnerships? Yeah. And uh, it looked, you know, you can look at certain data within your, your system mm -hmm. that'll show you that they're effective. So you, it's a matter of identifying those. Yeah. Th those measures and actually actually recording it and seeing it, if they're improving because of the partnership. Yeah, I mean, we will look at that a little bit further as we solidify the, the metrics around it. Um, I think that I would put our partnerships up with the uh, organizations within our community up against any in the state. Oh, I think, yeah, um, best. We yeah. have excellent partnerships with the, uh, the college, with the uh, health department, yeah. um, you name it, uh, and they, they've been very helpful. Um, and but we'll continue to think about how we can yeah. monitor you, that. You can't underestimate the impact of that. I think yep. good partnerships. Yes, yeah. more question. Uh, not a, not a question so much as a comment. And I told you I wouldn't have anything to say the first meeting, but I couldn't resist this. <laughs> Is that the parent of a not that recently graduated uh, northern student? Uh, I caution you against playing a whole lot of weight to test scores because the students aren't nearly as motivated on standardized tests as the school system mm -hmm. is in seeing them excel. Uh, for a large part, they think it's kind of boring and a waste of their time. Uh, I, I think measures like AP or apprenticeship results would be much more meaningful measure. Uh, admittedly, the public expects test scores, but the students aren't nearly as motivated as the system is. I, you're 100% right <laughs> in terms of motivation of students for test scores, as those of us who have taught know that very well. That that's yeah. a very difficult uh, mountain to climb sometimes with some kids. Other questions Just about uh, this, this segment? Still got one more slide we want to look at. Well, <laughs> we jumped to the uh, strategy slide a little bit ago on the screen um, because there is some interconnectedness. Um, the priorities are the big buckets. The strategies are some of the more uh, detailed work that uh, we are going to be engaging in in regards to the blueprint. Um, and and so we're just looking for feedback on this on any specific strategies that stand out as particularly effective or concerning or any feedback that the board would like to provide. I think you're we're probably going to get the most feedback once we see the policies, procedures, once, that, once we see that uh, mm -hmm. from Thursday and we get that in our hands to sure. look at. I'm sure there'll be some questions. But. Sure. 
And and I was going to, to add that as we were looking at the policy procedures as far as our goals for, for the school system and priorities. Mm -hmm. um, I would also add, since I'm, I'm looking at the clock a little bit, that certainly um, anyone from the public who is listening in and mm -hmm. would like to give us input on mm -hmm. these priorities and strategies, we would be more than happy to consider that input and beyond tonight, board members, of course, if you have additional input beyond what yeah. time allows tonight, we would be more than happy to consider that. Yes, we will be uh, having some community focus groups coming up later this month. Um, so I'm in the final stages of getting that organized and announced to those who have expressed interest. So reach out to me soon if you're interested. <laughs> um, do you have something else? Yeah, just okay. one final comment. I mean, I have full faith in, in all of the staff um, at Garrett County Public School Systems to pull this off. But I think as we look at the strategies, I just need a lot more detail because there's nothing really with teeth here to tell me what we're doing or what success looks like. Yep. Um, and as we build it out, I think we'll get there. But we yeah, have so. a lot more. I just gave you very high level yep, here. Absolutely. Um, we have it built out in much more detail. It's just not ready to go public yet. Yep. So. And when it is, that will be great because when people ask me questions about this, I really don't know what's behind that. So yep. I can't really give them any information yep. behind what's Yeah. There. No, so. this was designed to be very, very high level to make sure we're not missing something significant. Mm -hmm. um and and we did want to talk to teachers and staff which we did in july uh and then we'll do the community and then we'll solidify things while we're on good news i, I and you mentioned successes and broadening our definition of success <laughs> Um, and, and I'll just end with this, um, just publicly so that people in the public know, I know the board is already aware, um, the AIB has indicated that our blueprint implementation plan that we submitted for March 1st and May, March 15th and May 1st, um, met the criteria for success. And that was a lot of hard work by a lot of people in our system. Um, and I just want to draw that to everyone's attention. Most importantly, if you actually listen to the AIB um, meeting, which was about three and a half hours long, so you might, you might have to do it in chunks, but um, they did, um, I believe they talked about eight systems that have met the criteria at this point. And I really did feel in listening to, to their discussion that they did lift up Garrett County in very high regard. Um, they especially noted and talked at quite at length about our uh, Judy centers um, and our three and four year old classrooms, uh, the collaborative classrooms with Head Start and that model of the three and four year olds and ensuring that we're meeting all of their needs and kind of ahead of the um, head of the game on that and, and leaders amongst the state, those those were their words. And also our needs assessment and the way we're looking at data and analyzing data to drive our next steps, uh, they lifted up as a model across the state. So um, I know that a lot of systems have worked really hard and our system has worked equally hard, but it was very nice to hear some of the positives. So, so you have Congratulations. Yeah, I, have, I have a question Sorry. with the focus groups. I know you haven't done the focus groups with the families yet. Um, what do you think um, a partnership with parents is going to look like, parents in the community? Mm -hmm. So that will largely be driven at the school level. We already have at the elementary schools, and well, especially our Title I elementary schools, but I would say all of our elementary schools have a rooted um, system already in place to to pull parents in and to bring parents in. So it's just more about making that systematic, making that really focused on some of the initiatives that we're trying to do instructionally um, and ensuring that parents understand what we're trying to accomplish with, with students and what their children are learning. Um, so it will be largely at the, at the school level and, and really honed in on the particular needs of the school and the community. Okay. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Go ahead, I'll go one more last comment. Go ahead. Well, D Dr. Miller did a great job of presenting this and noting um, that Garrett County's blueprint plan was 
one of the few in the state that has been approved at this point. And of course, what she did not point out is that it was her leadership in working with groups of people to get us to this point. So I just feel a need to note that and to um, thank stellar work in this regard. Great job. And I, I, I'll reiterate that. She stole my thunder a little bit for me, but uh, <laughs> uh, we are very thankful for you. I mean, truthfully, I know you get some tough questions, but that's what we were elected to do uh, and to, in, to ensure that things are, are going well. But, but uh, we are very thankful for you. Please, please know that. You, uh, it's a, an impossible job, <laughs> it, and we know that. But uh, by being one of the eight counties that did the impossible job says a lot. So thank you very much. Okay, that being said, we're done with you. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> all right, Cadence, it's all yours. Yeah, there was no public comment, I'm sure. <laughs> <laughs> That's very impressive. Thank you very much. Very impressive. Any questions, comments? Cadence? Thank you, Cadence. Uh, Superintendent's uh, report, uh, any board member reports? Any Anything from the board? Um, people mentioned stuff the bus. Um, mm -hmm. I urge parents to come out or anyone to come out and help us stuff the bus Friday. Mm -hmm. um, I'll be there as well working Friday morning. It's going to be a Walmart. Okay, superintendent updates. I do have uh, a couple updates, uh, and I'm hopeful that some uh, parents are listening in from home and some of our students. Uh, my first update is about cell phone use. And I want everyone to know that our Northern High School and Southern High School leaders have been discussing the use of electronic devices during the school day and will be informing students and parents regarding expectations for the upcoming school year. At both high schools, cell phones, smartwatches, earbuds 
are to be turned off and put in a backpack or in the student locker during the school day. Once students are dismissed to class in the morning until the dismissal bell in the afternoon, there are to be no devices turned on or on their person except during lunch. At lunch, students will be able to use their devices that will give them an opportunity to contact parents during that time if their schedule has changed for the end of the school day. We're making this change because we've seen an increase in, unfortunately, cheating, filming other students without permission, conflict instigation because of social media, and misappropriate use of artificial intelligence during the past year. And much like school systems across the country, we're trying to mitigate these issues in a reasonable manner. There is no change at other levels of the school system as cell phones are not allowed during the school days at those levels. High school administrators will be sharing this information within the next couple days and probably continuing after that through um, their website pages and through social media. So we really are looking for uh, parent and public support as we make this change at both of our high schools. The second thing that I would like to bring to everyone's attention attention is that schools have published times on the GCPS uh, website for back to school nights being held, held on August the 28th and 29th. Opening day for students, which is a half day, is on September the 3rd. And we are looking forward to a great year in collaboration and partnership with our families and communities. You may have also noticed on social media that we have begun focusing already on the theme of student attendance and how regular attendance is the key to academic success. Please note, regular attendance, consistent attendance, it matters. We know that students who attend school consistently build a very strong foundation for learning. So I'm inviting through this venue, all stakeholders, particularly parents, to join us in supporting this initiative so that our students have prime opportunity to learn from our highly qualified teachers. And then I'll just end that may we all have a very safe, productive school year. Thank you uh, so so much, uh, Dr. McCourtney. Uh, one final thing for clarification: the stuff the bus is August Friday, August the sixteenth. Uh -huh. Is that correct? Yes. Okay. Yeah, this this coming Friday. Yeah. Correct. Right. And it's from what time? Eight to five. Eight to five. Okay. Great. Thank you. Anything else? Anyone? Okay. I take a motion to adjourn. So move, Jason. Second of us, eighty. All those in favor of adjourning public session, second of us, saying aye. Those opposed, nay. And we are adjourned.